Hello, Village Heights family. Thank you for being here on this uh, brisk morning. It's brisk, so I wore my corduroy. Uh, Tanner told me it looks scholarly, uh, so I need y'all to lower your expectations, okay? Do not, uh, I know Greek today, anything to talk about like that, so, so please work with me. Uh, but before we get into it, um, if you open up the Bible app, and uh, if that graphic up real quick. If you're a good little Christian, you should have the Bible app, just saying, okay? If you're not, I mean, get on it. So download the, Bi- the Holy Bible app there. Uh, go to more, click events, and click Village Heights. should come up as geographical, the first one. And then everything we're talking about today, all the songs that we sing, scriptures will all be in there. Any announcements? So, all right, we are in week four, our final week of Fork in the Road. Uh, we are the sum total of the decisions that we make, the, the fork that we choose, right? So when we hit this fork in the road and we choose a path, we become whatever that path was. And not necessarily that we can reverse. Sometimes we wish, man, I wish I could go back to that fork. It's a little too late, okay? You can sometimes hope that there will be a similar fork in the road coming into your future. But basically, when it happens, it happens. And so I want to start this one off um, with a quote from a very famous, very wise uh, philosopher. And the quote is, if you come to a fork in the road, take it. Some of you might recognize that. It comes from the famed, very deep uh, Yogi Berra. Uh, Yes, the baseball legend and manager. Um, He actually had a lot of things that he said. They they called them yogiisms. Uh, Here's a couple more. It says, uh, no matter where you go, there you are. Uh, (laughs) If I didn't wake up, I'd still be sleeping. Uh, And then lastly, always go to other people's funerals. Otherwise, they won't go to yours. See, some great advice. And so we hear these things, and we're like, oh, that's, that's funny. And it's true. It is. But sometimes we hear something that it's like a simple saying, and we're kind of like, it's not really that complex. And so we, we go, yeah, that's true. And then we kind of dismiss it. But the truth is, even though these, these might be silly, they're impactful to your life. They can have an impact. So the thing that we're going to be talking about today is one of those things. It is simple in saying, um, but it can be very impactful in your life. And so today we're going to talk about the important, choosing the important over the urgent. Now, if I came to you and I said, choose the important over the urgent, you'd be like, duh, that's just kind of common sense, Bill. Why would you need to even say that? That's, That's a yogiism, right? Why would you even need to? But the truth is, even though it's simple, because it's simple, we dismiss it. It's funny how we don't practice this. Too often, we choose the urgent over the important. How do I know that? Because we end up with things like this. We think things like, I wish I had more time to spend with my kids. I wish I had more time to pray. I wish I had more time to read what I want to read. I wish, this is one for me. I wish I had more time to work out, right? <laughs> That's a real easy one. You know, you, get, you schedule it the day before, and you're like, oh, gosh, I got to go do this thing. Darn, I can't work out today, right? Whatever the urgent thing is. I wish I had more time to fish or for my hobbies. I wish I had more time for friends. I wish I had more time for travel. And this is a big one. I know a lot of you say this, and I hear this a lot. I wish I had more time to serve at Village Heights. I really do wish I had more time. That's a personal jab for me. Um, But when it comes to things in our life that we see as important, being a part of church is important, being being with your kids is important, all of that. But we let the urgent things take us over. Urgent things like, I got a yard to mow, right? It's going to keep growing. I got some dishes to do. It's just going to pile up. I got some diapers to change. Some of you probably heard this from your parents. I got mouths to feed. You probably said it yourself. I have as a dad. Um, and I love this one. This one you hear a lot. I've definitely said this one. Sorry, but I got bills to pay, right? The urgent, the thing that are in front of your face. I got some chores to complete. I got that work project that's just looming over me. Urgency is just growing. Some of you, it's, I have the perfect Instagram caption to create. And it's very urgent, right? I had this great picture, and I got to make this great caption, so everything's got to wait. It's urgent. So we have all these things in our life. So what's the common response that we usually have? Most of us probably say it. When they say, hey, how are you doing? You say, busy. 
right? Is that what you say? That's, I'm very guilty of that. I say, oh, I'm busy. I got a lot going on in my life. I'm very busy. I can't do this. I'm never able to relax. Are you, did you get to take a break this weekend? No, because I was busy, right? That's kind of how the response, usually what you hear nowadays. Let me give you some truth um, about the enemy, about the devil. If he can't cause, tempt you to sin, the next thing he's going to do is make you busy, if he can keep you busy, he can keep you from doing the things that are important. Because busy means urgent. Like, there's a lot of urgent things. Uh, back in the, If you went to church in the 90s, uh, the church in the 90s kind of took this tactic, like try to use it against the devil. They're like, well, if, if we occupy their time. So, like, if you were a person that went to church Sunday school in the morning, and then you went to service, and then you went to Sunday night service, and then you went to the Tuesday prayer meeting, and then you went to Wednesday service, and then there was something, an event going on on Friday. The, the church in the 90s had this idea that if we just occupy their time, they can't do anything bad. If they're always here, they're never anywhere they can do something bad, right? We tried to use that. It just ended up making me not like church, right? <laughs> that's what, like, I'm always here. I'm sick of these people, right? That's kind of the way I, I felt. Uh, but that's what the enemy wants to do to you. If he can't tempt you, if he can't cause you to sin or do something negative or hurt other people, he's going to make you as busy as possible. He's going to throw some urgency in your life so that you are never able to get to what's important. And I know this because how many of you have ever said, there's just too much to do? There's too much to do. Or you said, you feel often rushed. There's never enough hours in the day. You felt that way. Well, I'm going to tell you this. Never say, and remove this from your vocabulary, I don't have enough time. Remove it. I've been working hard to remove that from my life because the truth is you have time for what you have, choose to have time for. Whatever you want in your life, whether you think you're choosing it or not, you get to choose what you do with your time. You are a free-willed soul that can take, and I understand if you're a parent, you got responsibilities and things like that. But if I went to you, you're like, I don't, Bill, I just don't have any time. I could go to your life and I could chisel things. I was like, is this really needed? It's really not. Chisel away and we will find some time to focus on what's important. So I'm telling you, choose the important over the urgent. So kind of what this looks like. So if you're in business, uh, you work at a business, you own a business, and you have an angry customer. The urgent thing to do is to deal with the angry customer, right? Like, oh, we got to get on this, got to make them happy. The important thing to do is to build systems and practices and a culture that circumnavigates and alleviates the pressure for the possibility of an angry customer. That's what's important, not just dealing with what was urgent. Because if you just continue to deal with the urgent, angry customer and never fix on the back end, all you're going to have is urgency and angry customers. That's kind of how that works. Um, getting your car repaired when the engine light turns on and you freak out or a light that you've never seen before. And you're like, what do I do? Urgent is getting it fixed. But what's important is taking care of your car on the front end, getting the oil changed regularly so that you don't end up in the situation where the light turns on, right? Some of you couples are like, yeah, I'm telling them, I'm telling them, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> that's important. Take care of it before it needs to be repaired. Getting help when you're sick. When you're sick, it's urgent. You need, you need help. You go to a doctor, right? But what's important is taking care of your body before you get sick. You can alleviate, hopefully, in most things in your life. There's a lot of health things that we go to the doctor for that if we would have took care of it on the front end, we wouldn't have to go to the doctor for it, okay? So important over urgent. If you do the important, you won't have many things that are urgent. That's just the fact of it. So choosing the important over the urgent will actually relieve pressure, It'll make it in your life where, like, I actually have time to do things because I worked on the front end to alleviate that pressure. That's one of the motivations we have behind action groups. So action groups, if you're new, we do action groups every year, and it literally, as it sounds, is action. You can't be a part of the group if you don't do something, okay? Because if you show up and you're not doing anything, you're going to feel real awkward because we'll all be racing around you and pointing out saying, hey, why don't you do something, do something, do something, do something, right? It's an action group. So what we do is we pick a charity, a nonprofit, whatever it may be, someone that can use some support in, in our city. There's a lot of great nonprofits doing a lot of great things. And we go to them and we say, hey, what are your needs? And this is always what happens. They always tell us the urgent need. Like, oh, we need to feed these people right now. We, we need a meal done uh, within the next whatever. We need this lump of cash to do this thing right now. It's all urgent because that's what they've been conditioned to do. 
Because all we do is usually take care of the urgent. So with Village Heights, we come to them and say, okay, what are your needs? All right, we understand that's urgent, and we will help with that. But what can we do now that's important that will alleviate the pressure for whatever's urgent? We set them up for a better future. So last year, we helped out Hope Center Houston. Hope Center Houston, they were feeding people, and that's a constant need, right? And they're helping people find jobs, the homeless people, and that's constant need. But then there was a need of spiritual growth in their people. They, we need a space, we need a place that's safe where they can come to, and they can learn more about God, and they can develop in their spirituality. So the urgent thing would have been done, you know what, I'm going to come preach a weekend for you. I'm going to take my worship leader, I'm going to throw them at you, and they're going to do some great songs, right? That would have been the urgent thing, to meet a quick need. We said, no. How can we help with the future? So instead of just showing up on a weekend and preaching a sermon and just doing that, we'll do that kind of stuff. But we said, let's build out a space that make it a lot easier to invite people in and that you can even host people, creating an atmosphere where it's really easy to help people spiritually. And so that's what we did. So a lot of the projects that we do, we're focusing on the important. It's about giving a leg up than a hand out. See, if we get a hand out, the hand's going to be out again just the next week. But if we give a leg up, there's no reason for the hand to be out. So Luke talks about this, about the important over the urgent in a story talking about uh, Mary and Martha, two sisters. And uh, we will usually, if you've read this portion of scripture, you kind of glaze past it and you're like, oh, huh, that's funny, right? And you kind of move on. But there's a, actually a really important message in this interaction between Jesus, Mary, and Martha. We find this in Luke 10, uh, 38, starting there. And it says, As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She said she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. So Martha felt some pressure, right? Jesus is coming, and I have the opportunity to host. So she felt this pressure to host. So when you feel the pressure for a guest, just even a regular guest in your house, what happens at your house? Somebody's coming for dinner. You frantically make your house look like as if nobody's lived there. And, and you only rent that place out for hosting. They don't even get to see where you sleep and live. So this is all just staged so that we can host you. That's what you do. You're cramming things in the closet, making stuff disappear, cleaning every crook, uh, crook and cranny of your house. But that's just a regular person. They're in somewhere in our house. I don't know where it is right now. There is a set of china that has not been used, but I know it's just in case the queen or the president comes to our house, right? If you haven't seen the china yet, I'm sorry, you just haven't hit that level. Keep working harder. You might hit that level one day. Who knows? We'll see. But there's, some, there's, it, there's something about it. It's like, it's just more important. The son of God, the savior of the world is coming to Martha's house. Imagine the pressure that she is feeling. This place has to be perfect. There can't be a speak. He can see all sin. He can see all everything. He's God. I got to wipe it all away. Imagine that pressure, all right? So, of course, she would love to spend time with Jesus, because that's the whole reason you host, to spend time with the people that are coming into your home. Love to spend time with Jesus, but she was so preoccupied by the urgent. It was clouding her. She was feeling, feeling all this pressure. Martha missed the important because she pursued the urgent. We continue on in Luke 10, 40. It says, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to Jesus and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. She tattles on her sister to Jesus, the Lord, right? What? That's the, that's, there's nothing higher, right? Like, I'm taking it to the top. She's not helping me out. And you ever been in that situation? Like you're doing something and you're like, I'm doing all the work and they're just sitting around on their butts and, I, and they're not helping me out at all. They're all just enjoying them. You ever been there? Is it only me? Okay, fine. Uh, Martha was distracted by all the preparations. So she tattles, tattles on, on her sister. 
So have you, I, I, I do this all the time. It, it drives Hannah nuts, and she loves me through it, which is a beautiful thing, and I thank her for that. But anytime we leave the house, we need, especially when you're leaving the house with kids, man, it's a lot of urgency. Put your shoes on. Don't forget your underwear. You know, brush your teeth. You, know, you have to get yourself ready and get them ready and get out the door. It never fails. I will get like a half mile, a quarter of a mile away from our house, and I'll go, did I lock the door? Did, did I? Because that's important. Locking the door is very important because we want to come home to a house that hasn't been pilfered, that had things that haven't been taken. We want the things back that we left to come back to to be comfortable, right? And so I, it, it's a couple times that like circle the block, you know, and I go back and I check in. I did lock it. I just can't remember because I was so distracted about the urgency to get to whatever thing that's outside of our home that I, that I forget about the important thing. Martha was doing this exact thing. What are you distracted with? What are the urgent things in your life that you are faithfully pursuing and totally missing the important? And it, it's funny how this works. It's never until the urgency lets off that we realize, oh, wait, I forgot to think about the important. The urgency, that, that feeling, it really clouds your mind. So to circumnavigate that, you got to do something on the front end. You got to say, you know what? I'm going to focus on the important, and then we're going to get to the urgent after, right? If it even needs to be met. Because honestly, some things just kind of work themselves out. It's continuing on in Luke 10 41 through 42, this is Jesus' response to her. Martha, 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 you got to Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. What's the most important thing you've been distracted from pursuing? What are you doing and being in your life that has distracted you from what's important, the things that you know is important? Is it time with God? Because if it's important, you should set out a goal for that. Is it time for God? Is it time with your kids? Is it marriage? Is, is it making time for that? Is it working out? Again, that's one of my problems. Is it working out? Is it reading more? Is it going to church? I mean, sometimes the urgency of getting wet from the rain is enough to distract people from coming to church. It's okay, guys. I know it's a stab, and I, and I love you anyways, but I, I, I get that. That's, that's enough. You're like, I'm too sweet. I'll melt. I can't come, right? I, I, you won't see me the next Sunday because I'm melted, right? No, you, we see things that are urgent, and we let it distract us from what is important. Choose the important over the urgent. So in choosing the important, like, okay, Bill, that's great. You've made a good argument. How do I do that? All right, so how do I choose the important to be able to tell the difference? So we're going to talk about three things. So this is time for, for notes. So if you are taking notes, it's time to write it down, or you can fake it with your finger and make me feel good. All right, so number one in how to get better at choosing the important, number one, create arbitrary deadlines. Create arbitrary deadlines. Some of you, I'll give you a second to Google what arbitrary means. But ar create arbitrary <laughs> deadlines. So, and just, uh, so for example, uh, on Sundays, well, what I'm doing right now, preaching, so we have two gatherings. We have one at 9 a.m. So technically, my message in notes doesn't have to be finished, technically, until 8.59. That's just the truth. It really doesn't. It doesn't have to be done because I don't have to speak it because I can't be during service over there Googling, what does this mean in the Bible? You know, I can't, I can't do that, right? I got I to gotta be ready, but 8.59, it's got to be ready. Technically, that's the deadline. But for me, I, have, I want to be able to be on the front end of this. So what I do is I set a deadline for myself by Thursday. My notes have to be in, and I got to know what I'm talking about by Thursday. And so I do that because, one, it alleviates the pressure so that on Saturday I can actually kind of enjoy a Saturday and do something with my family at night, right? And so I'm not worried about Saturday. What am I going to say tomorrow? Who knows? i got to start Googling, you know, that kind of stuff. So I make sure that's done. So that means on Friday and Saturday, if I get an idea, I can go back. It's a lot easier to go back and make a change than come up with something fresh on a Saturday night. I, I, I've learned the hard way. Uh, so make 
arbitrary deadlines. It doesn't have to be done by then, but I'm telling myself it's going to be done by then. And you're thinking, I can't do it. You can do that. Um, if you are a person who's a workaholic and you like, can't seem to have, be able to get home to have dinner with your family, make an arbitrary goal. Nobody's making you have this, and technically you could stay there longer. They'll let you stay there 24-7 if, if you have the wrong kind of boss. Um, but tell yourself, I am leaving the office by 345 every day. Every day. I don't care what's happening, who's showing up, what, what's happening. 345. I'm gone. It changes how you operate in your day. So if you tell yourself, I'm not staying until 5, I am leaving at 345. So when you get there at 8 o'clock, you don't go to the coffee pot and chill there for an hour, catching up with everybody. You don't do that. You're like, nope, I'm leaving at 345. I got things to do. I got important things to get to after work, so I got to get my work done. So what does that make you do? It makes you have faster decisions, for one, you don't mull on things so much. You make a quicker decision. You delegate better because you have to, because you're not going to be there all day. You got to delegate. And it makes you, and this is a very important one, say no. <laughs> say no better. No is a magic word, guys. It gives you freedom. It really does. Say no to things, which brings me to point uh, uh, direction number two. So number two, be cutthroat. And I mean that. Be cutthroat, selective with your yeses. Be cutthroat, selective with your yeses. I mean, be ruthless about it. Do not hand out a yes unless they have earned it. Those yeses better be, woo, they, they got to be something good. Because a lot of us would say a meaningless life would be a lack of, uh, a lack of commitment to things. But and that might be true, but I think an overcommitment to things is also a meaningless life. You can be so busy committing and saying yes to everything to make everybody happy, to make you feel good, to make them feel good, that you end up doing so many things poorly that you can't do anything great, and you end up with a meaningless life. So saying no will give you the freedom to do things great. Busyness does not necessarily equal productivity. Have you ever gone through a day where you worked constantly and you did a thousand things, but you've accomplished nothing? <laughs> Do you ever feel like that? It's because you said yes to too many things. Learn to say no. Um, in my uh, position, what I do here at Village Heights and in this community, I get offered to do some, I'm just kidding, quote, cool things, right? Cool, cool. You would think that it's cool, not really cool, but here's the catch. When it comes to the cool things that people want me to come do for them, speak engagement, whatever it may be, they're always urgent, right? They're always urgent. Hey, we need you to do this thing. And they'll always wait like the day before to call you because they don't want you to think about it. <laughs> they don't want you to think about the possibilities of what could happen. So they like, I come to this cool thing. So it excites you. And unfortunately, I've learned this the hard way and I've, <laughs> I've fallen for this trick because there's things that you think about that like, man, I would, that would be so cool. Right, because I'll be invited to speak at something, and it's a platform that I didn't have to build, literally, physically, or metaphorically. I didn't have to build it, and, and now I get to say something and have some influence. I'm like, yeah, but I've gone to these things, and this always happens. They want to use who I am to push whatever agenda they have. So you end up in this situation of like, all right, I'm here. It's urgent. It's cool. I'm excited. And then they start talking about a subject that you want nothing to do with or actually feel differently about, but there's a cameras looking at you, and there's people looking at you, and you guys just grit and smile like, ugh, this was terrible. Why did I do this? Why did I fall for this? That's happened to me too often. So now, if somebody calls me, I don't care how important they are, if they call me and say, hey, we need you here tonight, tomorrow morning to talk on this thing, if it's the next day, nope, ain't happening. I'm not responding to the urgent. I'm going to do what's important because what they're talking about is important. We can take time to prepare. We can flush out what we're going to talk about. I can hear everything that you're going to say too and know that I agree with it or don't agree with it, right? Don't get hoodwinked because I got hoodwinked. Because the best leaders don't do more. The best leaders do more of what matters most. 
And I said the word leader, and you might have dismissed yourself because I'm not a leader. I don't do. You are a leader. Every single one of you is a leader. If you are a human out in the world doing something that somebody can see, you're a leader. Because they see what you're doing, and you are leading them through your action or your words. I don't know anybody that's figured out invisibility yet, right? So, so everybody in this room is a leader. So I'm talking to you. Leaders, the best leaders, don't do more. They do more of what matters most. Which brings me to number three. Number three, do first what matters most. Do first what matters most. Uh, don't be the one who says, if I have time, I'll work out. You'll never have time if you can justify it within your mind. <laughs> it won't happen. Don't be the person that says, if we have time, we'll go on a date. Your marriage and your relationship is important. So going on dates is important. And so you're thinking, oh, man, I, I just don't have time to make a reservation, get a babysitter, all that. You don't have to do all that to make a date. Just last week, we, Hannah and I wanted some alone time together. So after the kids went to bed, we went in the backyard, made a fire, had some s'mores together. It was a great date. You can get creative and make time for what matters most. Get creative. Don't be the person that says, one day, we'll take that weekend getaway. One day, I'll take a day off. That one day will never come because everybody in your life does not care about your one day. They care about their one day. And they will, they're like, this would be great, but it doesn't happen. They're not going to be like, oh, everybody stop. They need their day. <laughs> that does not happen. They want every ounce of you so they can have their day. So you got to put it in stone. I don't care if aliens touch this earth, a meteor is coming, whatever it is, I'm taking my day. I am taking my day. That's why with our staff, they say, I need this day off. Put on the calendar, it's happening, you're dead to me on that day, okay? You, you are gone on that day. That is your day. Because I don't want you coming back to me saying, man, I wish I had my day. No, you're getting your day, okay? Because you're going to do some good work when you come back. Uh, <laughs> don't be the person that says, I wish I had time for it. Because you have time for what you choose to have time for. You have time for what you choose to have time for. So if you're constantly busy, you're choosing that. You can say no to those things. Everybody around you, they're usually adults, and they can handle themselves. They might make you think that that's not true, but it's true. So do first what matters most when you choose what you're doing in time. Reacting to what everybody else wants will just leave you in this this circle, this rabbit, this infinity of always trying to please people and giving them all your time. So do something in preparation for that. So mark your calendars. Do something in preparation. Make decisions now of breaks that you're going to take later. Hannah and I, we were, it wasn't even 2022 yet. And we were already talking about the vacation that we're going to take in 2022 because it's going to happen. I don't care where it is, well, how we're going to do it, or how much money we got to do it. It's going to happen. If we're going on a vacation, whether you like it or not. You can't stop me. <laughs> a lot of times we think about people in our life, and we're like, man, I wish I could have more people over, but my house is not good enough or perfect enough. Or you're saying, I wish I could have more people in my life, but I am not put together enough or good enough. You single people. Uh, here's some truth. If you think that you got to be perfect to find that right person, you're wrong. Because the right person wants you in those moments of imperfection. That's who you really want to spend the rest of your life with because most of your life is not perfect. Sure, you're going to have those moments where you put the right dress on or put the right suit on and you track the right lady or right man, whatever it may be. But after that, it's just a series of in perfect things happening, that you're growing closer together through the process. If you think that you have to make yourself perfect, you will be the most lonely person on earth because it's never going to happen. You're never going to be perfect. There's never going to be a house perfect enough to host. There's never going to be a person most perfect enough to be with. So what do you do? You choose people over perfection. If Hannah and I decided when we started Village Heights that it had to be perfect church, 
perfect setup, perfect building, perfect graphics, perfect everything, before we could open the doors, you wouldn't be here. They never would have opened because it's impossible to be perfect. So we decided, you know, we're going to lean into the imperfection and we're going to be honest about it because we're going to choose people over perfection. If you take that path in your life of choosing people over perfection, you will find immense opportunities to grow deeper with people, to know more people, to grow further with people. Choose people over perfection. So workaholics, workaholics, you know who you are. If I, if I went to your family and I said, where do they live? And they go, they don't live here. They live at the office. Red flag. Red flag. Do something about it. Because you can produce the greatest things at work. But if you neglect your family and lose them, it wasn't worth it. Because your job is to make a means to support your family, right? To grow your family, to be with you, to provide things. And so if you're too busy producing, thinking that is your worth, you'll end up losing the thing that actually gives you worth, and that's your family. And even spiritually, if you're so focused on your finances and your job and hoarding all that you can, that you ignore the one who created you, you are ultimately, and unfortunately when you die, you will literally lose the thing that gives you all purpose. So you have to choose now the important, over, I'm not saying don't do the job. Don't, I mean, do that stuff, but set boundaries and choose the important over the urgent. Because if you're only responding to the urgent, they will never let you leave the office. The product will never be good enough. The, what you're offering what, it will never be enough for people. So you have to decide yourself what is the line that you're going to make. Martha chose the urgent. Mary chose the important. Mary chose what is better. And this is one thing I love, that Jesus, because Jesus could have said, oh, Mary, Mary chose the better thing. And he could have stopped right there, and he wouldn't have been wrong. But watch, this is, what, this is what I'm saying. This is really important. Watch how he finishes it off. He says, it will not be taken away from her. Why did he say that? Think of the, the, the gravity and the magnitude of it. The Savior of the world, the Creator, Jesus, Lord, is making a statement. And when he makes a statement, it's a promise. He says, it will not be taken away from her. If you will focus on what's more important in developing the important and not just responding to the urgent, you will develop things in your family, in your businesses, in your marriages, that nothing in this earth can take it away from you. That Jesus will solidify and he will build into you, build your character and who you are. In my marriage, I want to have the best marriage that I could ever have. And so what I did, instead of just saying, you know what, I'm going to be the best me and her work off of that. No, I said, I'm going to first follow Jesus and let him strip away every ounce of pride that I can survive in that moment that, and take it all away from me so that I can be selfless. And it has saved us so many times. Because there's a lot of times that I can make a justifiable argument of why I'm right and she's wrong and she's done the same. But then because we serve Jesus... And we choose him first. I mean, when we come together and get married, you get married in front of a group of people, you make a covenant, you get a holy man in there or somebody official to make it, to make it like this is a big thing because you're trying to create a bond. And that's what scripture tells us. It creates a bond that nothing on this earth can compete with. Meaning, if you do it right, if you commit to it, to what's important, first Jesus, then your relationship, he will create a bond with you, the two of you, that nothing on this earth can take it away. Nothing. He will not, nothing will be able to take it away. So it's not in vain, and it's protected. That is one of the beautiful things about it. It's not only are you doing what's important, now it's protected by the creator of the universe because he wants that for you. He wants to keep you on the right track. And if you just stay in line, Important over urgent. He will keep you there. So that's my challenge for you guys. And this is going to help you fulfill whatever goal you have this year. If it's to be closer to God, 
first thing you do when you wake up, talk to God. If it's, if it's to be in better shape, to work out more, first thing you do when you wake up, and I know this is hard, I'm not a morning person, work out. Just do it. Don't give yourself the opportunity or let life's urgencies distract you from what's important. Do it. Put it front, upmost, top of the line. And if you do that, Jesus will come back and solidify. He'll build your character. He'll create boundaries around you. He will coach you, give you wisdom, give you all that you need to continue to what's important. So choose the important over the urgent always. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you're committed to us. Thank you that, that it's not just about what we could do or, or these things that we can meet, but just you're committed just for us to have a relationship with you. So you let us, you give us the permission to not be perfect because perfection is impossible for us and we'll, it'll just cause a chasm. So Lord, right now, I pray that we dismiss those things that we feel that we have to be perfect in. We dismiss those things that, we've, that are just urgent and they're knocking on our door constantly, Lord, that we were able to take those distractions, push them in, so we can focus on what's important. You, our family, the leadership, the opportunities that we have to love people and lead them to you. And Lord, as a church, help us continue to stay focused on the important and not responding to the urgent, whatever the hit thing is in the news right now that everybody's got to not just respond, but to keep focusing on you and growing closer because growing closer to you will take care of all those other things. So help us focus on that as a church, individually. Lord, thank you for this time and thank you for Mary and Martha. Thank you for the story uh, of them, the, the, the leadership in that, the wisdom in it, so that we can develop ourselves in it. Lord, bless these people as we go. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.